Amen. I'm glad you made it tonight. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Now, I, I, I'm sure you did get an SMS, and um, I wanted to share um, just on uh, the basics of deliverance. Uh, you know, I never dealt with this subject, really. And, um, I, I, you know, I like to just kind of talk about faith all the time. But I think God is prompting me and showing me how there's an invisible barrier around the people of God because of different things that's causing them not to kind of have a manifestation of the blessings of God. And so that's why I feel so strongly, even though so many things have been happening, that I should still stick on Wednesdays to the theme of the basics of deliverance. But before I share, and the subtitle, of course, uh, let me just share this with you, is the basics of deliverance, and the subtitle is Seven Steps for Retaining Your Deliverance. So I'm going to just teach and you're going to listen, but I'm sure God's going to help you and deliver you from many things. Now, if somebody could help me, please, uh, could I get, uh, where's it? Uh, Eddie, could you come and help me, please? If you can get me that little packet there. I just want to show you how innocently all of us can make mistakes and bring things into our home that, that will prevent blessings uh, from occurring or preventing, you know, blocking your blessings. Now... Let me just show you what I found on my bookshelf. Just some of the stuff. Uh, so you see, your pastor makes mistakes too. And uh, so you must never feel condemned. And don't feel kind of, uh, you know, belittled in any way, shape, or form. We're all learning. And the point is, when there's a trespass on your property, all you want is you want him out of your property. That's, that's what you want. Now, I went to a bookstore. This book I haven't read yet. I went to a bookstore. I bought this book. It's a brand new book. It's called the, the Everything Prayer Book. Isn't it? It looks nice. Great title. I looked at it and I thought, wow, okay. I'd like to look at that. The first thing I glanced at, who was the author? And when I swung the book around, the author here, um, maybe I shouldn't mention it, but yeah, I think I shouldn't. But anyway, the author is a, a Christian named author. So obviously it's not, you know, uh, kind of new age. You, you, you can have a look at it there. I won't mention it, but you can see there. Now, I bought this book. I put it on my bookshelf. I said, when I have the time, I'll read it. And I'll just see what it is. Now, this morning when the Lord got me up to pray, my eyes fell on one of my bookshelves. And, my eye, and as I kept on praying, I kept on seeing the spine of this book, the prayer book. So I walked up to the bookshelf and I grabbed the book. And I, and I turned it around, and I read the back. So the Holy Spirit is marvelous. He'll always lead you and show you something. Now listen to this. It says, and I'll read it to you. It says, prayer is guaranteed to lift your spirits when you're feeling down, comfort you at a time of great loss, and give you direction in a world filled with chaos. The Everything Prayer Book is a practical, inspiring guide that helps you to find just the right words and emotions when communicating with God. So far, sounds good. Prayer is not limited to one faith, one country, or one ethnicity. It spans the world and it's universal in its power to heal and instill hope. From discovering the how-to aspects of opening the heart and soul and connecting with God to specific prayers for a variety of concerns, the Everything Prayer Book shows you how prayer can positively impact your mental and physical health as well as make your wishes come true. The Everything Prayer book shows you how to pray when recovering from the loss of a loved one, facing a career setback, battling with illness, making difficult ethical decisions, and searching for peace. No matter what your denomination or religion, the Everything Prayer book enables you to clearly express yourself, find just the right words for every occasion, and allow, allow your deepest feelings and emotions to be heard. <laughs> so I turned to the inside and I started to look here. And it gives you prayers on all types of religions. What's an English book? Perfectly innocent. But at the same time, devastating. Now, I'm just showing you how innocently sometimes we can bring stuff like this to our home. Now, if your pastor can do it, <laughs> then it can happen to you. 
So don't feel condemned when we talk about these things. I'm openly telling you that this was on my bookshelf. You know, I didn't read it, you know, but kind of I introduced it to my home. Now, that's the one. Um, I'll throw it down there so that we can push it there. Now, I'll show you something else. I bought this. How many of you know? This is still brand new. It's in the, in the sleeve. You can see that. I haven't opened it. I bought this. This is um, Bruce Lee videotapes. Now, let me tell you why I bought them. They, they're on DVDs. I bought them because I said I'll hide them somewhere. And when my two grandsons grow a little bit bigger, I'm going to give that to them as a gift because you can't find them then. And I'll tell them, now, this is the movies we watched when we were young. Because I watched all of his movies. But the Lord said, pick it up. So I picked it up. Now, you, I didn't buy it for me. It's still sealed. Look there. Here's the price here, 3 dollars That's 400 rand. That's going to get burnt. Listen to the title, The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, Way of the Dragon, Game of Death, Game of Death 2, Bruce Lee the Master, Bruce Lee the Man and the Legend. So, then Pastor Terry and I were talking, <laughs> and how many of you got that book? How many of you bought this book? That's universal religion. And so forth and so forth. And I'm just showing you, there's the DVD of The Secret. Brand new. I haven't opened it. It was in my bookshelf. Pastor Zubeda bought that for me in Cape Town as a birthday gift. And Cuban Beats. Just the sound of drums, innocent. Oh, and I did a little bit of research on this here. This is the introduction of other religions into that. And it's satanic by origin. Now, I'm just showing you. Can I get somebody, please? Just don't, don't be afraid. I'm touching it. The anointing's here, so. Just put it in the packet for me, please. And put it in the corner there, and we'll take it and burn it. So I'm just trying to kind of show you as an introductory thing how we can introduce things into our home. All right? All right. So I just wanted to make that as a kind of visual illustration so that you can kind of get the gist of it, that you're sitting at home with music, things on your iPad. By the way, I had the Quran on my Kindle. Yeah, that's true. Uh, because when I did my thesis and I did research, I had to kind of look at that. And I just felt uneasy about it the one day, and then suddenly the Lord reminded me. The Holy Spirit is amazing. The Holy Spirit r reminded me and said, delete that off your, off your iPad. And I deleted that off my iPad. So I'm kind of just showing you how sometimes, especially when it comes to birthdays and it comes to Christmas time or Easter time, or it comes to those festive times when you're just in a good light-hearted mood and we start to buy just things innocently and we bring them into our home, but with it, it comes, a spirit comes with that, all right? Okay? So, we'll, we'll talk about those things, but I want to talk about uh, tonight then the basics of deliverance, and my subtitle is The Seven Steps for Retaining Deliverance. And I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, to Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 10 to 18. Now, this is what the Bible says. It says, it says, finally... Uh, and this is talking about putting on the full armor of God. The Bible says, And finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, and wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And um, verse number 13 says, oh, I just read verse 13. Verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, several things we can talk about the Scripture and, and, and just as an introduction, I want to remind you as a Christian, as soon as you become a Christian, you are in warfare. You are battling against forces that are invisible, that you cannot see. Now, God gives us several pieces of armor in this portion of Scripture, and I just want to mention them before we move on. One of them is, the first piece of armor is loins, good about with truth, or what we will call the girdle of truth. Now, Paul used the illustration because I suppose he was so much amongst the Roman soldiers that, you know, the girdle, because they wore a tunic, men and women wore a tunic that came upon the, about their knee or even longer, but to hold it together, if they needed mobility, they would put a girdle around that. So the Bible talks about here, that that's what we should do, is put a girdle uh, uh, of truth around us and the girdle speaks of the following it speaks of number one speaks of honesty sincerity openness and frankness and that's something sometimes we as christians lack the girdle of truth speaks of honesty sometimes when you miss the mark and make a mistake like what i have done i was not ashamed to show you tonight that i purchased some items that i felt the lord rebuking me about are you with me so that was this honesty and frankness that I made a mistake. And how many of you also, God wants you to admit when you make a mistake and, and, and do something wrong. So that because with that, in, with the sincerity and the frankness, then God's able to forgive you and mend you and put you back on the road to recovery. All right? Then he talks, the second piece of armor, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate of righteousness is an important piece of equipment because it protects your heart. The breastplate here protects one of your most vital organs, which is your heart. Now, you remember, that brings to mind Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That means God is saying, protect your heart with all diligence. In other words, make every effort to protect your heart because out of it flows the forces of of life. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Now, watch those two words, very important. Faith and love. You cannot really uh, live a victorious Christian life if it is not by faith and love. So those two things are prerequisite in your life. You must have faith and love. Say amen to that. And the Bible says, for helmet, the hope of salvation. So the helmet, the hope of salvation. All right? So faith and love are very important, as I've already pointed out to you. So that means in your Christian walk, you cannot allow anything to interfere with those two fundamentals. Uh, because that's keeping your ship steady. Faith and love. That irrespective of what hits you, you must always still have faith. And irrespective of what comes against you, always keep on walking in love and forgiveness because maybe as you would perceive an issue to be contrary and working against you, but God's testing you in it and is using somebody to test you. So we must see the deeper spiritual truth, and this, not the surface of it. Because sometimes we think, well, we're justified to be angry because he didn't treat me right. But the point is God may have used that incident to test you. To prove you. You, you, you. you understand? So, and then he talks about the third piece of equipment is the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Talking about shoes. Now, in the Roman times, what they had was the, uh, you know, uh, kind of a sandal and leather tongs that would go up to your calves here. It was like straps. And it says the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that speaks about the shoe speaks about the following. It speaks about it giving you mobility and stability and availability to your commander-in-chief. 
Now that means God, Jesus Christ, is really the commander of chief of God's army in which we are. Your shepherd, your pastor, who is your under-shepherd, is also your commander in, commander in chief. Although Jesus Christ is the chief commander. Are you with me? And so it means that we must always be in a position as Christians to do what God's telling us to do. Like, for example, this morning when I was... Um, uh, kind of prompted by the Spirit of God to get up, and God started to deal with me and point things out to me and say, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and I was able to mend it quickly. See, it speaks about mobility, and it speaks about you responding very quickly. Now, it also speaks about uh, the study of God's Word and the memorization of God's Word. That means you've got to be a student of the Word of God. The Bible says study to show yourself approved a workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. It also speaks about the memorization of Scripture, and it also further speaks about the intelligent communication of the gospel. So those are the three things that you should be, as a Christian, you should have under your belt. Number one is studying God's word. Number two, memorizing God's word. And number three, the intelligent communication of the gospel. Now, people don't understand what God did in your life or in your heart. You need to communicate that intelligently to them so that they will come and understand. Then, of course, it also speaks about the peace to the heart and mind if you obey it. That means if you do all of these things, God will give you peace and God will give you, um, uh, you know, the mind, uh, peace in the heart, peace in the mind, as you will do the things that he's asked you to do. Then the shield of faith. Now, in the Greek New Testament, talking about the shield of faith, the, the, the Greek New Testament talks about two kinds of shield. The first kind of shield is a small circular shield, and the second kind of shield is a huge shield that was like, almost like a door, and it would protect the whole person. Now, Paul, in his reference here, when he says, take the shield of faith, he was not referring to the first circular type of shield. He was talking about the second type of shield, which was almost like the size of a door. That means if you held the shield of faith in front of you, you were completely covered from toe to head. And that means if the enemy would throw any of his fiery darts or weapons against you, you were completely covered. And so God is telling us here that we as Christians need to take the shield of faith. And use it against the onslaughts of the enemy, the fiery darts. Why? Because God is covering you. All right? Okay, so we're talking about the large rectangular shield. That was what Paul was referring to and he was making reference about that shield and it protects you completely. Now, remember this, that Satan will always counterattack you. Because you are in a spiritual warfare. Are you with me? That means, I understand now that you have, you know, you have the love of God and God has shed His love upon your heart and, and you're excited about Jesus. But understand that when you're walking in the spiritual walk, always Satan will throw something at you. And when you're fully covered, he'll throw something at you through someone closest to you. Are, are you with me? So when these things happen, don't think it's strange. These things will happen. But greater is he that's in you than he that is the world. That means you will overcome it. Are you with me? Now, let me give you an illustration, a little story of that happened, not to me. I read it in a book. He was a minister. He said that a woman came to church and she sought deliverance. And uh, was a Christian woman. And um, the minister asked her, well, what, what is really wrong with you? And she said, well, many times... I just had the thought of committing suicide. I wanted to commit suicide. So the minister that was delivering her or helping her, he determined by just the probing questions that this woman, uh, he was dealing with the spirit of suicide. So what he did was that he cast out the spirit of suicide from the woman. This was in church in the day, and the woman got delivered of the spirit of suicide. Now, simultaneously, what happened when this was going on, unbeknown to the husband, the husband was traveling on a freeway with a truck. And on the back of the truck, there was a huge dog, their pet dog. And he used to always carry the pet dog with him, uh, you know, 
it, it would just stay at the back, mind its own business, wouldn't jump off, wouldn't do anything strange. So it was like, you know, kind of um, just a casual ride with, with the lady's husband. But all of a sudden, as the minister delivered this woman from the spirit of suicide, simultaneously the dog, for no apparent reason, jumped off the truck and killed itself instantly on the highway. So later on, when they got together and started to discuss it and talk about it, what happened was the spirit of suicide that left the woman jumped into the dog and killed the dog. And simply, we learn something from this, is that when somebody closest to you is being delivered, what will happen is that you'll find that spirit will whiplash. And so what we must learn to do, and I'm not trying to make you afraid now, what we must learn to do is that when we go through that process, what we must do is immediately cover our close ones, our loved ones with the blood of Jesus Christ. Simply because we know that's how the enemy will attack and that's how he unleashes. All right, so our shield is faithful protection and provision for ourselves and all to whom God has committed to us. That means we must pray as Christians. We must cover our loved ones with the blood of Jesus Christ. We must pray a wall of fire around them. We must ask the angels of God to encamp round about them. Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. Are you with me? When your husband leaves, leaves in the morning to go to work, and I know many of the women still also work, but when your husbands go, Understand that Satan wants the head of the family. If he brings the head down, he brings the whole family down. And so every husband should have a praying wife. His wife should be praying for him, covering him with the blood, speaking good things over her husband, simply because why? Satan will attack him first. Are you with me? And will try to bring him down. And if he could bring him down, then he brings the whole family down. And then together, you know, vice versa, the husband should pray for the wife. And then the husband and the wife should pray for the kids. Then you should pray, you know, for your family and for all your property. And then also, you know, cover yourselves with the blood of Jesus as you would travel in your transportation. Pray for your pastor and your church as we pray for you. Now, Pastor Zubeda and I have comprehensive prayer lists. We pray for all the business people in our church, the professional people in the church, the tithe paying people in our church, the elderly people in our church, the young people in our church, the children in our church. We have specific names and prayer lists. And we pray and cover people every day. We trust that you're doing the same thing for us. Because understand, even for me as the leader of the church, Satan will always try to attack me. Because if he can bring me down, then he can bring the whole church down. And so as much as I pray for you, I also need you to pray for me. Say amen to that. So it's not something that's a, a nice or a, just a goody good thing to do. It is something that is very real. We must be covering each other with the blood of Jesus. So we must cover each other with prayer. Now, let me share this also from personal experience. Whenever you launch out in the ministry or a ministry arm, you'll find attacks and counterattacks of the devil. I found that every time I wrote a book, the devil would unleash everything against me. And that's the truth. I found that when we would break into the area of radio and television, for the whole year, I just had attack upon attack upon attack upon attack. Too numerous for me to explain to you. Do you understand? But I was not ignorant of the devices of the devil. But I knew that I was taking territory in the atmosphere. Because when you take the radio airwaves and television airwaves, what you're actually doing is you're coming in direct conflict with the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. And so he will always unleash itself against you or himself against you. So think it not strange, beloved, when these things happen to you. Because sometimes we see things happening to Christians and we think, well, you know, they're just not nice people. And yet, those people probably are living very clean lives, loving God, coming to church, doing whatever God wants them to do. But the point is, why are they suffering? 
with so many assaults upon them. It's simply because Satan is throwing things at them. And what God wants us to do is to pray for them. Not criticize them. Because when we criticize them, we leave them vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. We need to cover them with our prayers. And listen, God is good. In this sense that if they have to learn anything out of that, God will teach it to them. You know, experience, you know, life's issues will teach them. So we don't have to kind of be double, kind of, you know, ugly to people. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So we, don't, we, we might not comprehend the issue in full. We may not understand it. And all we can do is that, listen, I'll, I'll, we'll just pray for them. You know, I, I, I'm not their judge. I'm not their, you know, chief criticizer. All I have to do is just pray for them. There's some decisions I'll be making as a church leader. You may not fully understand it. God didn't ask you to fully understand it. You just pray for your leader and say, God, help pastor that he will, by revelation, inspiration, you'll, he'll make the right decisions. You'll lead him the right way. And we pray for him. Are you with me? Because when you criticize, what actually happens is that you make it easier for the enemy to attack them even more aggressively and assault them more vigorously. Are you with me? So Satan will attack. If he does not attack you personally, he'll attack something that you depend upon. Now this is where I want to talk to business people. Now, if you're a businessman or a businesswoman here, understand this here, that when, when he can't attack you personally, because you've committed yourself to Christ and you say, well, I, I want to I wanna, uh, uh, wanna serve Christ and mm, I'm doing the right things. And what he will do is that he will attack stuff that you're dealing with. People that you depend on. He'll start with your staff. How do you, one, I mean, you know, one moment in time your staff is absolutely great. Everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. You know, they, everything is in order, everything's organized, and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. They're going crazy, they're disorder, there's confusion, there's strife. Actually, you know what's happening? It's the devil's just counterattacking, and, and he can't get to you, so he's getting to the people that you depend on. So what you should do is, the fastest thing that you should do is get into agreement with your wife if you're married, in other words, because the Bible says one puts a thousand to flight, two puts ten thousand to flight. So when you come into agreement with the person closest to you, you become ten thousand times stronger and agree and just say, Lord, we command by faith. Now you're picking up the shield of faith. Say, well, Lord, we command now uh, strife to cease, confusion to cease. And Lord God, there's complete peace in that place. Amen. Or you might even get that in terms of your marriage or in terms of your professional environment, something like that, goes crazy. Um, you know, all of a sudden, this person that's absolutely calm and collected and treating you well, all of a sudden turns against you. And you can't figure that out. You haven't done anything wrong, but you're trying to figure out, why is this person all of a sudden against me? It's because Satan's launching a counterattack. Because of something that you did, he's now launching attack. And what you do is that get into agreement with somebody and pray against it. Amen. So those that support you, those that are closest to you, he'll try to get them. So we must hold out then the shield of faith for full protection and provision. That's the time to say, no weapon fashioned against me will prosper. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm from above, not from beneath. Satan, I command you, take your filthy hands off my business. I command you, take your filthy hands off my marriage. I command you, take your filthy... Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to... Don't sit quiet and say, tomorrow will be a better day. No, that's not the right stance to take. God wants you to speak. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. So He wants you to speak out. So that's the time not to keep quiet and, God wants you to speak out. So you boldly stand up and say, I will not tolerate strife. In the name of Jesus, I order and command confusion to stop, to cease, and perfect peace to enter here. And sometimes you find that even in the church environment, you find, a, you know, amongst the, a few people, they just go crazy. Even sometimes it happens amongst the leaders. So I don't fight with them. I just stand back, I look, I observe, and then I speak. 
Do you understand? Are you with me? Because we must not entertain the spirit of strife. The Bible says when we entertain strife, we entertain every evil work. So you must hold out your faith. Now, I want you to say the following confession. Would you say this with me, please? Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I hold out the shield of faith for full protection and provision over my home, over my family, over my workplace, over my business, over my body. Now, Satan, take your filthy hands off me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That's it. You don't have to feel anything. You don't have to feel goosebumps. You don't have to turn around and say to somebody, Oh, I just felt something. No, you, you uttered a decree in the atmosphere. You took control of it. Now that means whatever Satan was launching against you, now you picked up your shield of faith and you protected the fiery darts from hitting you. Say, so Satan, I rebuke you. I rebuke the power of confusion and command peace and order to be restored in my life. Amen. Now sometimes that may happen with your kids. All of a sudden you find your kids are fine. All of a sudden they go crazy. Well, that's what you need to do. That's what you pray. You just pray that prayer. Short little prayer over them because it's a, you understand as a parent you're not dealing with a, a force that you can see but it's an invisible barrier that's causing confusion and is getting to your peace because he's using your children to disturb your peace. So all you do as a parent is say, uh-uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, don't, don't tell the child that now. Say, but you know you're rebuking Satan. Say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. You will cease to use my child to cause strife. Are you with me? And then, of course, you must claim protection over your family. And so you will say something like this. Say, in the name of Jesus, I claim protection of faith in the blood of Jesus over everything connected to me. Amen. That means your business place, your vehicles, your environment, your finances, all of that. He'll attack you, so you decree that. You declare that. Sometimes it's nice just to take a print out of your bank account. You know, all your statements. You know, you know what I'm saying? Your bank account, or your checkbook, or your cards, or your purse, or your wallet. Place it in your table. Place your hands over it and decree that protection over your savings account, over your business's account, over your, you know, check account and say, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my finances. It will not deplete, but will multiply. God will provide. And especially when doubt starts to hit your mind and Satan tells you, well, you're not going to make it this month. You're not going to meet your budget this month. What is that? He's trying to introduce the spirit of fear. In your mind. Now God says in each word, He's not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Or you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you've got a dreaded disease. Immediately what hits you is fear. So you plead that prayer over you, the protection. All right? And then God gives you the helmet of protection. That's the fifth piece of armor He gives you. The helmet of salvation, rather. And in Romans 8.37, the Bible says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, right? More than conquerors through Him that loved us. Say amen to that. So the helmet, now listen to me very carefully. This is very important. We think the helmet of salvation, what do you mean by the helmet of salvation? The helmet of salvation is protective gear for your head. As the, as the breastplate protects your heart, the helmet of salvation protects your head. Now watch this now. The, one of the worst injuries to sustain is the head injury. Whether it's an accident or an assault or violence of any kind, the worst injury to sustain is injury to your head. So if you uh, are injured in your head, you must know that's quite serious. So Satan knows that. So where, where will he strike you? He'll strike you in the head. What do you mean he strikes you in the head? He strikes you in your mind. That's why God gives us the helmet of salvation to protect our mind. Because the battlefield is the mind. 
Satan attacks you vigorously in your mind by throwing thousands and thousands of negative thoughts into your mind. You're sick. You're going to die. Your husband's having an affair. Your children are going to die. Something's going to happen. You know, you're going to lose your job. Uh, there's a retrenchment coming on. You're going to be number one on the list. Or if you have been, or, you know, lost your job, you'll never get another job again. Those are doubt. That's fear. The Bible says God hasn't given us that spirit of fear. That means you got to put on the helmet of salvation to protect your mind. You cannot, listen, I cannot protect your mind. You have to protect your own mind. That means you got to cast down those thoughts. And this is where you have to for yourself say, in Jesus' name, I'll get another job. In Jesus' name, I'll get another business. In Jesus' name, I'll do better. Come on here, somebody. Are you with me? You cast down those thoughts. Or if he says, well, something's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. You say, no, 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 no. To my family, no, Satan. In the name of Jesus, I've pleaded the blood of Jesus. They are protected by the blood. Nothing's going to happen. Are you with me? So that's what you do. So the helmet is for the protective gear for your mind. So do not let negative people speak negatively to you. You must pray that negative people don't speak into your ears. Pray that prayer. Pastor Zubeda prays that for me. She prays that I don't hear things I shouldn't hear. I don't see things that I shouldn't see. Because all of that, what you see, your eye gate, what you hear, your ear gate, eventually droops, drops into your heart, seeps into your heart, and then it twists you on the inside, makes you negative, makes you cynical. So you've got to protect your heart. You see that? So the battlefield is the mind. So it's, it's obvious then you have to protect your heart, but you're also got to protect your mind. Because I find that with Christians, they are great. They have great hearts. They love God. They love the church. They love the things of God, but they fail to protect their minds. That's what they do. Because anybody says anything, they believe it. It's like sometime I'll pick up the, you know, the remote, and I'll put the TV on, and I'll be watching the news, and the Holy Spirit will say to me, put that off. Because he knows now he doesn't want negativ negativity to hit my heart. Because once you start watching all of the news all of the time, what happens is that they just feed you. It's fear-driven, fear-based. But we are not in the kingdom of this world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We're in the kingdom of God. We have another economy. We have another king. We have another constitution, which is the word of God. The word of God is leading us. The word of God is guiding us. We have another economy. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you have another economy. Amen. Of course. And God is your source. Say amen. amen. Listen, business people, the business is not your source. And working people, your company is not your source. Now, they may be instruments God uses to be a blessing to you. But ultimately, behind all of that, God is your source. And God will not fail you. And I'm sharing with you, as I prayed this morning, I saw that in the Spirit. That God is breaking now, as I rebuke that thing, the spirit of poverty. And the spirit of lack of our entire congregation. Say amen. amen. Alright. Then when negativity hits you and assails your mind over and over and over again, you get into the first stage, what's called depression. And when you get depressed, then all sorts of things start to happen. You don't want to serve God anymore. You don't want to come to church anymore. You become cynical. You make excuses. You stay away. You don't respect your leaders anymore. You're cynical that your boss at work. You just get, you're just in a state of depression. Why? It didn't start like that. It started with just a little bit of suggestion from the enemy. You won't make it this month. Or he brings doubt, a little bit of doubt. You entertained it. And that little bit becomes a stronghold. The Bible actually talks about it as a fortified place in your mind. Now you believe that to be true above the word of God. 
If somebody comes and talks faith or speaks faith to you, you are cynical towards that and say, no, I don't think, I, I don't agree with you. Let's, let's look at the facts. See, but the point is we don't deal with facts. We deal with faith. We're dealing with the Word of God. So yes, it might be a fact that the doctor diagnosed you with something bad. But, but the Word of God is above that diagnosis. Say amen to that. Are you with me? So facts, yes, of course, is important. But we, we, we deal with truth. Are you with me? And truth is always, you know, above the facts. Say amen to that. Now, what does the relief to all of the depression when you allow doubt to hit your mind is found in Isaiah 61 verse 3. It says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's why when you come to church, guys, don't let them prompt you and prod you to praise. You should praise just because you will to. So if you find that you have a garment of heaviness on you, guess what happens now? That thing lifts off you because you begin to praise God. Don't be ashamed, clapping your hands, singing and dancing before the Lord. That is what will give you relief. Say amen to that. So it says, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, But let us who of the day be sober. In other words, think soberly. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. See that? The breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That means salvation is an all-inclusive word. I've explained that many times. The hope of salvation. Better days are ahead. God's going to provide for me. God's going to see to my every need. God's going to keep me wealthy and strong and healthy in Jesus' name. I'm a tither. I'm a sower in the kingdom of God. I'm a child of God. The angels of God are going to take care of me. He's going to protect me. He's going to keep me. So you keep that hope in front of you. See, as long as there's a vacuum, there's no vacuum, Satan can't fill it. So you're keeping that faith-filled life before you. You're keeping the fire of God before you. Are you with me? You're keeping the praise before you. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, we, 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 we got to operate like that. Now, let me, let me say this. Faith operates and resides in the heart. Faith operates and resides in the heart. But, now this is where most Christians miss it because they have great hearts. But what they don't understand is that hope is built in the mind. So you've got to have a great heart for God because faith and love dwell there. But you've also got to have a great mind. That means, when I say a great mind, it means a fresh mind. What do I mean by a fresh mind? A mind that's regenerated and a mind that is renewed according to the Word of God. In other words, God's thoughts are more predominant or dominant in your mind than negativity. Now, let me, let me kind of give you a definition of hope. Now, here's, here's a lovely definition of hope. Hope is a quiet, steady expectation of good based on the promises of God. Isn't that wonderful? Hope is a quiet, steady expectation of good based on on the promises of God. I heard, I had somebody the other day, excuse me, I, ha I heard, had somebody come and ask me and say, uh, oh, you know, we've been sowing for a long time and we've been just waiting and, you know, there's no financial breakthrough coming through. And the first scripture that came to my mind, it says, be patient, brethren. In James, you know, be patient. For in due season, you will reap if you faint not. So I've learned that was when I sow, if I have a quick harvest, that's great. But if it takes longer, it doesn't really matter to me. I have this. A quiet, steady expectation of good based on the promises of God. There was one time 
Because one time I was praying for a certain breakthrough financially, and it took me over 10 years to get that financial breakthrough. And, and, and really, it was 10 years. Now, if you don't believe me, speak. To you. There's a witness in front of me, so I can't lie. That's my wife. She'll tell you. Year after year, after year, after year, after year, she kept on saying to me, she said, but when, but when, but when? You know how ladies are. It's like they want the money in the bank now. Like, you know, give me the figures, you know. Where's the statement? And I just kept on saying to her, I said, God will come through for us. God will come through for us. And for 10 now, it didn't take me 10 years for all my financial breakthroughs, but this particular one took me 10 years. And on the 10th year, I was smiling. So what I am saying to you is don't give up. Wait three days and God doesn't come through. You give up. Then you start to kill your seed. Oh, I think it's never going to work. Well, it's not going to work for you. Sometimes it will come quickly. And sometimes, other times, it's going to take a little bit longer. But hey, God is not a man that he should lie. Had he not said it, will he not do it? So hope, I want you to say this with me. One, two, three, go. Hope is a quiet expectation of good based on the promises of God. We missed one word out, so we're going to say it again. One, two, three, go again. Hope is a quiet, steady expectation of good based on the promises of God. How many of you feel revived with that? Because many of you have been praying for certain things and they haven't occurred yet. Hey, just be steady. Keep on expecting. God is going to come through. He must. And sometimes, you know, the devil will assail your thoughts as and you might feel there's something wrong with you. No, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> Just be steady. God's going to come through. Just be steady. God's going to come through. Say amen to that. In a sense, if I may put it in another way, in a sense, hope is continued optimism. That's what it is. Continued optimism. Irrespective of the circumstances of the things hitting you, you keep on saying, God is good. There are better days ahead. It might not be the way I want it to be right now, but it's going to get better. And it's going to get better. Say amen. I mean, I have a figure and I have a number for our church. I know where we're going to. It's very frustrating sometimes because of the stuff we want to do. And we have, you know, the limited finances. We have to do it. And the stuff that we need is costing millions. But we, you know, and it's frustrating. But I have a continued optimism Amen. that God will come through. I, I just know that. And you must have that too. Don't, don't. And Christians are very erratic today. They're very erratic. Today they're up, tomorrow they're down. You, you, you understand? God doesn't want you to be like that. He doesn't want you to be erratic. He wants you to be steady. He wants you to always be sober-minded and say, you know what? I'm going to stick with this thing until it works. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. You don't give up on your child when your child brings you poor grades, you know, at school. You just keep on sticking with him or her and working and working until they bring you better grades. That's how it is with life. Just keep on sticking with it. Better days are ahead. Amen. Say amen. So that is the protection for the mind. So keep on hoping. Tell your neighbor, keep on hoping. Do not give up hope. Come on, talk to one person. Say, do not give up hope. And then, of course, the sixth armament, and that's the last one. The sixth one is a sword of the Spirit. And I'll have to, st I'll have to stop maybe at that one. And then we'll pick up with the rest, probably on Wednesday. But it's all part of the basics of deliverance, all right? The sword of the Spirit. This is now, we're talking about how to maintain, how to keep seven steps for retaining your deliverance. Now, I haven't got to the steps yet. In other words, some of you have experienced God come through for you, and do certain things, but how do you retain that? How do you keep that? We're going to discuss that. So next Wednesday, we'll deal with that. But the last piece of armament I want to deal with is the sword of the Spirit. And the sword you'll find has, is somewhat a little bit unique, as discussed 
with re, you know, in comparison with the other five, because the other five are really all defensive type of armaments. But the sword of the Spirit really is kind of an offensive tool. Because the sword of the Spirit is something that you use against the devil. And I want to bring my lesson tonight to the conclusion with just a few points on this. The sword is an offensive weapon, and the Word of God really drives the devil away. That's it. You don't need anything else. You don't need to spit. You, no, that's true. You don't need to spit. You don't need to sweat. You don't, have, you don't have to do any funny shakes. No, no. Just use the Word of God soberly, intelligently. And just speak the Word of God. The Word of God has enough inherent power in itself to dispel the works of darkness. Say amen to that. So the Word of God drives the devil away. Ephesians 6.17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so you must understand that the Word of God does two things. One, it pierces. And two, it penetrates. The Word of God pierces and penetrates. Now Hebrews 4.12 is a beautiful scripture. Now listen to this. For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. Right? See that? So it pierces and it penetrates. There's nothing that can stop the Word of God from piercing and penetrating. So it doesn't matter what the devil throws at you, God's Word can pierce and penetrate through whatever the devil throws at you. Alright? Matthew 4 Verses 1 to 11 says, And Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. See that? And it goes on, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up to a holy city, and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and said these words unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, hmm? for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash your foot against the stone. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written, watch, His tool that He used, He said, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, again the devil take the him into an exceeding high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things, the devil says to Jesus, I'll give to you. If you will fall down and worship me, then say Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. Get behind me. For it is written, watch that, the word of God. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. The Bible says in verse 11, last verse that I want to read to you, it says, that the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Take note very carefully, what did Jesus use? He just used the word. What do you need to use? Not Daniel's fasting. Not any crazy stuff. Not running from prophet to prophet. Not running from meeting to meeting. You know, just a steady flow of God's Word into your heart, and out of your heart, out of your mouth, into the atmosphere against the devil, will pierce and penetrate every fortress and break down every wall, and you will get victory. Say amen. amen. We must stop practicing in the church charismatic witchcraft. Everybody wants a word. Give me a word. You have the word. You don't need to go to no fortune teller, charismatic fortune teller. I see a black fowl. No, I'd rather see a white horse. You, do you understand what I'm saying? We, 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 we don't need people to prophesy doom and gloom to us. We have a more sure word of prophecy. God is for us, not against us. He has great plans for you. I mean, what, what, what other word do you want? I just know God has a great plan for me and my family. And I know God has a great plan for you and your family and your children. 
and their descendants unto the third and the fourth generation. When you ask me, you say, Pastor, I want a word for my family. I have a word for you. You want to hear the word? Amen. God has blessed you and blessed your generations unto the fourth generation. That's a word from the Lord. What more do you need? Now, now watch, just watch this as I conclude. Neither Jesus nor Satan questioned the authority of Scripture. In this whole discourse in, 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 in Mark, chapters 1 to 11, verses 1 to 11, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus or Satan questioned the authority of God's Word. Because they, they, he misquoted Scripture and Jesus just gave him the Word. Satan never told him, that's not the Word of God. He knew the Word of God. And he knew there was a great power against him. And the basis, number two, point number two, the basis of every temptation that will ever assault your life is doubt. That's it. If there's one thing Satan wants to ever get you or bring you down, is doubt. He'll feed you with doubt. And thirdly, Jesus did not vary his method in dealing with Satan. He didn't in verse 1 use one one thing in verse 2, you use something else. In verse 3, you use something else. You'll find the consistency all through the verses. He just used the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. The Bible didn't say he shook, didn't spit, didn't jump, didn't perspire. He just says, it is written. It is written. It is written. How will you overcome? You just say, it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. God has a good plan for you. Amen. Amen. And I want to bring this to the conclusion tonight by saying that, listen, really, I really felt today, the morning when I prayed, it rained. Now, this evening, it rained again. I want to say that the curse for financial poverty has been broken off your life. That's what I want to say. Seriously. I feel that there's going to be a shifting now in the atmosphere. And God's going to do something tremendous for you. Let's stand up to our feet. Give God a good hand clap and a praise offering for what He's done today. Hallelujah. We give Him the praise and the worship. Amen. 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 Say amen. 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 God is good. Hallelujah. As I bring it to conclusion, I want to say goodbye to our television audience. I trust that you enjoyed God's Word. It inspired you and it lifted up your spirit. And I am praying with you and agree with you that God will give you the victory in every area of your life. Please watch us next week again as we say hello to you from Faith Center International here in Durban, South Africa. Let's clap our hands for the television audience. Amen. Bless the Lord. Now,